The awkward. Play, 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 and yet more idiosyncratic play. Now that constitutes a moment of gleaming, rationalised, funky awkwardness. This lesson in how to spot, become, feel and respond to being awkward and awkwardness is not a free lesson. This has cost implications and will be removed from your glowing orb that is your ISA. Lessons like this are rare, are less inhibited and more rounded, like a useless knife that rapidly makes the feelings of awkwardness increase. So let's begin. Firstly, make yourself into a ball, as tight as you can, as squashed and as useless as physically possible, and then, and only then, breathe out a sigh of relief, a sigh that signifies exponential tension release. Lesson one complete. Congratulations. Now you can progress to lesson two. Lesson two. Quick, no time to waste. You must think rapidly. You must no longer concern yourself with others. With anything that orbits your fragile psyche, instead move each finger separately, as if waving to a sailor, or some other profession of your choice, such as a butcher or waste management operative, or domestic appliance and space cleanser. Let's get lesson two back on track. Here, sit. Place your unsocked feet into this de awkwardizer This simple exercise in soaking your feet within this media backlash lather and fake orange zest multiplier will and can and can and will allow you to shake off these intense and zappy feelings of awkwardness. Finally, lesson three. Yes, the third and final lesson. Start to walk. Start to empty your cavernous mind of all workflows, of all metric bar chartiness. Implode and explode the reasoning for this life. To beholden you any longer to this sharpie of inconvenience. And instead, yes, instead. And this is a big moment for you. Take the proverbial plunge and, and, and breathe. Not through your mouth or nose. No, breathe through your septic tank of a basement that some call your spirit, or at least a zone of murky water surrounded by a time-lapse fence and gate that is eternally switched on. Now, all you have to do to complete lesson three and progress to the BTEC in gathering nuts for winter, which is level five diploma, is switch that time-lapse gate and fence back on well done. The Mobile Data Recovery Unit. I'm in no position to cast on any attempt to beam. In fact, beaming is a constitutional right. A right that all people are equipped to continue and complete in their own time. Rockets and the act of rocketing or repositioning oneself as a rocket is in some count is frowned upon and even outlawed. Let's talk facts and let's reassess this option to magnify the beacon as some sort of elegy or elegy or symbolic icon of hope that traverses social status levels and political apple propaganda. Instead, let's allow psychogeography to balance out our deepening and vault-like behavioral agendas and to finish the job it started, to enhance our beacon, our beacons, Warnings can be fruitful, warnings can be brash, warnings can be insightful, warnings can be served as a dish either hot or cold. Warnings are symbols of curved outposts, not necessarily significant, yet holding their own within a fortitude of other beacons. Heed the warning, heed the warning. They shout the lit from the leather seats, neatly positioned by the miniature beacons, that will outlast us all. A guiding light is not a bad thing. A guiding light can provide clarity, and clarity can provide comfort, and comfort can provide the best minds in the country with a sense of ownership. Ownership that transcends all tyrannical roots, rhizomes, and tangential equivalences. So, the answer, the root answer here, to the question you posed at the beginning of this sequence of events, stands as a simple, confirmatory, mobile data recovery unit. Hallelujah for the mobile data recovery unit and their power to conquer all with impunity and with a severance package that simply outshines like a beacon all other respectable packages on the market today. The semi-detached beast. They walked, they continued to speak, 
They said everything and nothing. Their emptiness was at once striking and simultaneously absent. They were prophesying. They were speaking in tongues of angelic formations, akin to that of the formation of a newly opened pack of biscuits. Positioned on a plate, a plate chosen specifically and purposefully to house the prophetic crumbs. This prophet was legendary and could manifest all sorts of wonders, illusions and planetary forms. I prophesy, I prophesy, I will take you on a mystical tour of this semi-detached suburban makeshift piece of architectural space, opening its ligaments, curvatures and hidden vessels for you to absorb. The question is, is this prophecy accurate? Can you embrace its meaning? And will this handsome semi-detached beast convince you of its holy powers? If not convinced, then think on this every pound of prophecy equals its sum in holy currency and therefore will ultimately balance out when and only when the great beast of semi-detachedness comes out to play. But what game will this semi-detached beast play when its opponents can't even reach the pitch, let alone a quagmire that some call a vestibule of rationality? One final call comes from the shaggy treetop overlooking the one-stop shop where Jeremiah is. He's perched, literally perched, awaiting the appropriate time. He glances to his blue Casio watch and with a clear suburban swagger of spontaneity only matched by the kestrel hovering above, shouts, I am the semi-detached beast and I will take you shopping, but not yet, my children. You must wait a little longer before my carpet is fully cleansed and those that wish to walk upon it can do so.